Danny, I work for Ableton in the UK. Thanks for coming first and foremost. This is the part of the Ableton Education Tour, which is a worldwide series of events where we've gone into a lot of partner universities and colleges. So I'll give you a bit more perspective on how Ableton Live is used both by professional artists or touring artists and um, within industry as well. So at today's sessions, we've got Marcello, who's gonna do a bit on Max for Live and how he uses it for performance and production. I will leave it to Marcello to take it away. Hi, nice to meet you guys. Uh, my name is Marcello Ruggiu, as Danny was, was saying, and um, I'm a certified trainer for Ableton since 2009. I love this software. To be honest, I do everything with it, uh, from music to recordings. I uh, almost play video games with it because uh, it's, really, it's really a great software. And there are some things that I would like to show you today that I think are very interesting. I personally uh, love the way Live has been built because it's a modular software in my opinion. You can build your own uh, tools, you can combine elements that are separated by, by default and then combining them you can get to uh, a lot of uh, creative results that uh, you might not expect. You know, uh, there are some crazy happy accidents that you can have uh, with uh, uh, Ableton Live and, and that's, in my opinion, one of the most interesting things. I mm, work with Live uh, uh, since uh, so many years because it's a very fast software. Whatever I have in my mind, I can click a couple of times and I, I have the, the result. And, uh, and yes, there are really no limits to what what you can do both on a music level but also on other levels you can create visuals you can have interaction between objects like colors and we will see how this works and uh, events of the software you can um, midi map anything and and uh, use the software uh, from a physical uh, surface like it is it is push that uh, as well has been a big game changer in my opinion. It's uh, one of those pieces of hardware that lets you express your ideas in a different way with a different workflow from what generally music uh, producers that are not into this kind of equipment uh, are using. So different workflows that definitely can bring to a lot of crazy, crazy results. And, uh, and in my opinion, um, this kind of interaction that the software gives between the, the, the your ideas and then the result is, is, a, is a very, very good compromise that uh, brings uh, the software not to be a place where you program music, but where you play actually. And I'm not a keyboard player, I am a drummer, and I have a different mindset from maybe a, a keyboard player or a guitar player. And I need a, a surface like this one, for example, where I can think in a different way and create compositions that uh, I I, I like. So today I'm, go I'm going to show you a couple of techniques that in my opinion are uh, mm, pretty pretty interesting. First thing we are going to see is uh, um, the use of, uh, of a device that we have in uh, Ableton Live uh, and Max for Live. If you want you can see on, uh, on the screen what I'm talking about is the mono sequencer. The mono sequencer is part of the Max for Live library and so uh, you will find it in your sweet version of Ableton Live. Now <coughs> why <coughs> I think the mono sequencer is is a great machine because it's a step sequencer. So when uh, uh, it's activated and you push the play button, it will run a sequence of nodes that you can then uh, modify with, uh, with your mouse. Now this is something pretty common in, uh, in many uh, synthesizers and, uh, and other virtual instruments. The good thing of this system is that patterns uh, that are by default locked to a 16 note uh, grid can run in different ways. And uh, I don't have on, um, only the, the choice of what is going to be the tonality of the notes, but also I have the chance to control uh, the velocity of each note and uh, uh, it's uh, the octave where this note is playing. So, so create sequences that have a lot of, uh, of movement. So 
So we can see that the sequence changes uh, depending on how I set the parameters here. You have the chance to change the duration of these notes and so create glides and, and staccato notes. It's a very, very easy system. You have also this last zone called repeat, where you can uh, re-trigger uh, the same note a certain amount of times, up to 16 times, and this can create some nice glitches. The last part here on the bottom is just a gate zone where you can turn on and off uh, the notes of this pattern and create variations on what is uh, the rhythmical sequence of, of this series of notes. In a very uh, short amount of time I'm writing a sequence that can be then played on top of a drum pattern and uh, on top of which I can add some other melodic elements. And so creating a pattern becomes a simple thing. One of the great tools that you have here in the, uh, in the mono sequencer is the chance to change the length of each one of these uh, loops and so create polyrhythmic uh, evolution. So I can have, for example, a sequence of, uh, um, let's say, 14 steps for the pitch parameter, while a different sequence for the velocity, let's say, a sequence of 11 steps, and a sequence of uh, four, five steps for what is the octave. And now when I will run this sequence, <laughs> the sequence starts to evolve in a kind of randomic way. The control on randomic events, in my opinion, is one of those creative tools that you can use in order to enhance what uh, you can write with a simple sequencer like this one. So for this reason, I'm uh, uh, going to show you a couple of MIDI devices that you have in uh, the uh, MIDI, library or, um, MIDI effect library of Ableton Live. Uh, now, the two elements I'm playing with, mostly, are the notes of this sequence. Actually, I have a, a sequence I prepared <laughs> before. And the two elements I'm playing, uh, mostly, are the velocity and their pitch, uh, together with their octave and duration. Mainly, what I would like to change, because after some bars, this loop might become a bit boring. The, the, the elements I would like to change, first of all, are the MIDI notes. The effect I'm going to use is the MIDI effect random. Uh, you will find it in the library, on the MIDI effect library of, of uh, uh, Live. Uh, it works on the value of the MIDI notes you are playing with your keyboard or you are sending from the, uh, the sequencer. It can make some calculations, so this means that I can add uh, a certain number between, let's say, 0 and 24 to the uh, MIDI value of uh, the note I'm playing. And then I can give a certain chance, a certain percentage of chance to my software and, uh, and leave him uh, uh, the choice to when he will add this value, this number to the MIDI notes and when he will just uh, stop working and leave the MIDI notes like they are originally. Uh, so let's see what happens if I turn on this device. We have the chance at 28% and then I, I selected 24 values that can be added, a certain number, to the MIDI note I play. This means that if I uh, play um, from my keyboard, so from push, uh, a certain note, well, actually let's have just a one note pattern. You can see that in a random way to a pattern that is made by just one simple note, one single note, I have some more notes that are uh, added to this pattern. So this is a way uh, that I can use to add some uh, randomic uh, elements to my sequence. What's the problem of this system? 
uh, is that uh, the randomness is quite high and uh, some of the nodes that are appearing in this pattern uh, are uh, wrong if compared to the harmonic scale that I'm uh, using for the sequence. So what I can do using another uh, device from the uh, MIDI effect of uh, uh, MIDI effect folder of live is uh, um, and, and this is the scale effect you find it here in the MIDI effect folder and scale I can basically uh, remove all the notes that are not part of the scale I'm using now I decided to use a scale of uh, D and in Frisian mode and so when I will turn on uh, this device all the notes that randomically are modified by the device random are going to be scaled and quantized to the right Frisian mode in D. So that randomness in this way is a bit more controlled and uh, yes, I can add variations to the original pattern but still keep the scale of my, of my composition. Another tool that I would like uh, to show you is the velocity tool. Velocity tool, this affects uh, in the synthesizer I prepared, affects uh, the position of the filter. So higher uh, levels of velocity will move the filter up, lower levels will bring the filter down and this cr can create some nice modulations. But again, this sequence is repetitive and after a while it might be boring. So I would like to add a certain level of randomness. And the velocity tool, again, you find the velocity tool in the media effect folder. Uh, it's very useful for this reason. Now the velocity tool by default appears in this way. You have uh, this uh, diagonal line that is showing you what's going to happen to the MIDI notes you play that arrive with a certain velocity will go out with a different velocity if you want and it works in a kind of in a similar way to a compressor uh, so you have uh, thresholds and you can decide uh, what will happen to the, to the velocity value of the notes you are playing now what I would like to do is uh, use this uh, velocity tool in a fixed mode so instead of um, follow the velocity variation of this sequence, I will make sure that the velocity is going to be always 64, 63, something like that. And this is what is going to happen. We don't have any more those filter modulations that were um, <coughs> uh, controlled by the velocity variation of the mono sequencer. Let's turn off the velocity. So now we can feel that the filter uh, frequency is moving and we have, let's have more envelope. Now we can recognize how the velocity is, is variating. Uh, it's variating the, uh, the cutoff of our synthesizer. I will now turn on the velocity parameter. And now you can notice that the filter is stuck to a certain position, it's not moving anymore. I will now add a certain amount of randomness from the random parameter of the velocity tool. And now we can feel the filter moving up and down depending on how, uh, how high is the velocity level. I will bring the amount of the assignment of the velocity to the frequency of the filter. Now in this extreme way we can feel how the variation of velocity is affecting, so this random variation of velocity is affecting the position of the filter. So this is a bit too much, let's bring down. Okay. 
So this is, uh, in my opinion, a very nice way to add some, uh, some life to your synthesizer patch. So this, this synthesizer will go on changing in time. If I play with this uh, controlled randomness of MIDI notes and velocity, I can add modulation. Of course, if I uh, go back to my sequencer and I start playing with different sequences uh, of MIDI notes, and uh, octave, I will go on and add more and more variations. And this can go on forever. Uh, so it's very, very important to say stop at a certain moment, because experimentation can be very, very funny. And, and, and literally, I could go on hours just changing these loops and listening the different results, isn't it? The next instrument I prepared uh, is a part of the probability pack of Max for Live. It's a free pack that you can download. Now, what I was doing before with the synthesizer, of course, can be done with drums. You can take your MIDI effect, velocity, or take your random effect and start adding random percussion notes to your, to your patterns. But this device has been made in a very, very smart way and will let you choose what's the probability of triggering one note or the other. So as you can see now on push here on on the small screen uh, there, I'm uh, adding some notes. Um, and these notes have the chance to be controlled for what is their uh, probability. So I have the chance to choose a different probability for each note added on, uh, on the step sequencer of my software. Um, so you see, when I add a note on push, I'm adding as well a note on the, uh, on the step sequencer here. Now, each note can be controlled uh, for what it uh, is the uh, probability that this note will be played. I have a control on the velocity as well. So I have the chance to write a pattern. Let's write a pattern with, say, a four on floor. So kick and kick and push play. Now, <coughs> uh, I can add a couple of more notes with a lower probability. So sometimes these notes are not going to be played. And sometimes yes. So the pattern starts evolving in this kind of controlled, randomic way. I know where are the nodes and the software decides when to play them or not. It's pretty cool what you can do, no? Starting from a simple pattern, then you can have a series of variations that are controlled, but happen in a, in a, in a very interesting way as well. So you can keep the groove of your pattern or your, of your original idea, but add variations. But also, you can have someone playing melodic element with this second device uh, from the probability pack. Now, this device is called Dr. Chaos, and uh, to be honest, it's very, very, very interesting, especially for its step sequencer uh, that works with these, um, uh, let's call them neural connections. So each 
step of the sequence is connected to the next step. And these uh, connections are controlled by this matrix here. So you can completely randomize the connection between one note and the other and affect the way notes are played by the sequencer. This can be randomized with the random button. By default, one step of the sequencer is connected to the next one, and so on. So the step one is connected to the step two, step two is connected to step three, step three to step four, and on and on and on. These connections can be randomized. I can add some chaos to these connections, and the sequence starts to run in a random way, so the notes are played in random positions, keeping the original harmonic pattern. Each pattern, each note, can be modified here from the steps, so you can turn up and down each note, modify its octave, its velocity and its length. And of course, if you want to have more randomness, what you have to do is just bring up the chaos parameter So now we have random nodes on random octaves with random velocities and random length. With a certain amount of, of chaos, not 100%. Of course, you can randomize any parameter of any node. All this chaotic sequence anyway is controlled. Inside of this device, you have a key, a key scaler, like the scale device of Max for La um, sorry, of the uh, MIDI effect folder, <coughs> where I can choose a root key, and again I choose to play everything in D and Frisian mode. Again, I would like to add some modulations to this instrument. I would like to change its sound in, a, in, in some way. I have this pedal effect that adds some nice distortion, but I would like this, F, this sound to change in some way. And I would like to have variations that are rhythmic to the sound of this uh, last synthesizer. To do this, I can use a very interesting device called Envelope Follower. This is a Max for Life device uh, that will follow literally follow the volume of uh, an instrument that is playing on your channel. So I put this device after the drum rack and we can see that now for every kick and snail we have a certain variation of that yellow line. It's literally follow following the volume of my instrument. What I will do is MIDI map uh, this <coughs> uh, variation to one of the elements of the instrument I'm using on the melodic channel. And I want to affect the volume of this second oscillator. So I will now click on the volume of the oscillator and I have for every kick and snare a movement of the level of the second oscillator that is adding this rhythmical variation to my sound. So every kick Yes, it's a MIDI mapping basically. It works exactly in the same way. So from the envelope follower here I have a MIDI map button yeah, and then you can go to any channel and uh, assign that parameter to any parameter you want. So I want the volume of the oscillator number uh, two, but also I can add more uh, modulations. So I can use the same envelope. Clicking here, I can MIDI map it to other eight parameters, isn't it? Eight. So I will map this one also. The third oscillator will move as well.
maybe this is too much, so let's control. As again, control is a very important thing. You can randomize stuff, but you need to control how much this movement is affecting your instrument. And so the control from the uh, envelope follower is given by these ranges. I like the first one, but the second one I probably want to have a less uh, wide action on the parameter, or maybe I want to invert its movement. So instead of going up, the parameter will just go down every time there is a kick. So now we have two inverted movements and this affects the sound in a more complex way. Bringing down the gain of the, step, the envelope follower, you will remove all, the, all these modulations and bringing it up you will enhance them. can smooth out the movement of the step, the envelope follower and have longer modulations. Okay, so let's go on. Another way to create variations on the parameters of my software is to use LFOs. And LFOs are another cool device given uh, in the max for live library. LFOs are amazing because they help you to modulate any parameter, like we were doing with the envelope follower, but using a continuous movement. Now, as you can see, I have already something that is mapped to the um, uh, LFO, but let's go here on the map view and let's delete these mappings. Let's go back to a default status where all the ranges are from 0 to 100 and let's give some, uh, let's have some fun with some mapping. We can map to the LFO the level of this oscillator, maybe not in a so strong way, so maybe just a tiny bit of modulation. But then we can MIDI map, for example, the sand uh, of our uh, reverbs or, or delays, and so affect uh, other zones of the software. Let's see what happens now. Now using this LFO I'm sending uh, my drum to the uh, reverb uh, that I have here on the channel uh, A. This is a convolution reverb from uh, uh, again the library of max for live uh, I would like to have uh, random variations of this sent to the reverb. So instead of using a sine wave LFO, I will use a random one that will start moving up and down at a certain rate you will decide from here. And so I will have moments with more reverb, moments with less reverb. This can be applied as well to other uh, sends of other channels. Let's have, for example, this synthesizer, uh, but with an inverted movement. So when the drum will go to the reverb, the synth will not go. And then let's map also uh, a bit of delay here and I have a third delay here. Let's invert this movement as well.
Now, another couple of things I want to show you are two devices uh, I created using Max for Live. As Max for Live is a uh, is this amazing infinite library of devices of uh, synthesizers, effects, and uh, MIDI MIDI messages. It's uh, incredible what you can do with Max for Live, and I really suggest you to dig the website maxforlive.com where you can find an infinite amount of devices made by musicians with uh, a certain, let's say, nerdy mindset where they program devices because they need them and then they release them for other musicians and most of them are free so this is a, a great uh, period where literally musicians can can share their instrument what I did I prepared a couple of instruments that I'm going to show you one is this replay device uh, replay is a sample trigger that I prepared for the students of uh, the school I work and uh, my students are, are doing live performance production so sometimes they need a drum on stage but the sound of the drum need to be electronic and they don't have maybe sometimes the budget to buy trigger microphones and maybe buy a software like Dramagog that is a great uh, sound replacer so what I decide to do is a device that in real time can capture any sound and convert it to any sample you can drop on on the device what I will do is go to the preferences of my computer enable my microphone built-in microphone here we go so as you can see here uh, this is the, uh, the signal path passing through my channel number 4 replay uh, as you can see nothing is passing through the channel I need to enable the channel in order to uh, have this signal uh, going through my device and my device has these two little fancy screens the first one is just a fancy thing it's just to see the waveform nothing nothing special it shows you what's the level of the signal you are uh, sending through your computer um, of course I have a input level that lets you boost a bit the signal but if the signal is not loud enough and you want to be sure that uh, a good transient is passing through you might want to add utility device and just crank up the volume you are not really going to care about the quality of the level uh, of the signal in input because what we are interested to is just the transient so even if the signal is distorted in the input this is not going to affect uh, uh, the quality of what is going to be the signal in the output the second little fancy screen is this one that shows you how fast the instrument is going to react to transients and uh, yeah you can have a slower reaction and you can see that now the instrument is answering in a slower way to what is the signal passing through and then we have some volume yeah because we want to boost the volume uh, at the end and uh, have our signal loud and solid so what i will do is go to my sample folder actually the drum folder and the drum it folder that i consider you to explore it's uh, probably one of the most underrated folders in, in in ableton live it's full of amazing samples you just have to combine them together into a drum rack so dig this library because um, it's literally uh, amazing the amount of sounds you have here and they are very very solid so let's go for this kick here okay so now uh, the file is uh, is loaded all right so now every trigger uh, every signal that is passing through the, the instrument triggers a new sample of course now it's very very sensitive and is receiving even some feedback from the from the speakers so if you have your kick loop somewhere and you don't like anymore that sound but you want to substitute it and that pattern has been recorded and you can't modify it well the solution is just to uh, replace this sample with uh, another one so I'm going to load this uh, series of kicks here uh, they are not so bad to be honest So we have all these kicks here, this pattern is nice, but I would like to use my kick. And here we go. So simply dropping a new file here will give you the chance to listen this pattern with a different kick. And 
then the second device I want to show you uh, very fastly is another little experiment I'm doing. I have a student that is uh, going to have a performance and her performance involves body movements and uh, she wants to control the software with some body movement. So I thought that I could create a device for her that can recognize colors and track them. This color can be used to move a parameter of the software. So I was thinking that uh, if I could, uh, for example, uh, change um, the frequency of a, uh, a filter synthesizer using a glove. She can wear a red glove or um, a red mask or she can wear a red t-shirt or a t-shirt with a red uh, point in the center. She could move in front of the camera and then affect one parameter. And so, like the LFO device, envelope follower, in the same way you can map parameters of the software, in this way I decided to make a device that will recognize the position of a certain uh, object, that in this case is going to be this pen. So let's select it. Oh. There we go. So as you can see, the software is recognizing the red, is uh, filtering out any other uh, color. And now I can uh, click on the map button I prepared here and go, for example, to this filter and select it. So as you can see now, this parameter uh, is controlled by the position of uh, the pen on the screen. Yeah, and that's cool because now my student might have some backing tracks and control the device in this way. I think it's a nice. A nice thing that can be used for different creative poses. Now the cool thing is that because you can MIDI map it to any parameter, it could be a trigger of a sample, it can be, I don't know, a video effect, it can be a video file, and because you are moving in a certain way, you will have some different projections. I'm thinking about mapping this device to some filters of my live performance and wear some t-shirt and because I'm moving in front of my computer when I'm playing this will create a, an LFO and uh, this LFO will always follow the BPM and actually if I stop I will stop the LFO and if I go back dancing this LFO will follow me again and so I think this is this could be a nice idea and a starting point for you know more crazy ideas. Now, <coughs> what I uh, want to show you now, the last uh, little thing is what is Max for Live actually. Max for Live is a is a software that lets you build softwares. It's a programming language. And what kind of softwares we can build in uh, Max for Live? We can build softwares for music applications. We can build synthesizers, effects, and so on. I'm not going to show you how uh, to build a synthesizer, but actually I'm going to show you where to start from if you are interested in this uh, big world. So I will open a Max Audio Effect and I will click on this little button so you can open the Max for Live uh, programming space. And just to I want to show you where you can start from. Now, I would like to create two simple objects with you that are not musically related at all. The first one is a clock. You might want to know how much time you spent in front of your computer. What I will do is use uh, two buttons. You know, uh, max for live has these buttons that are called buttons or bangs, and they, they literally blink when you click on them. And I will connect one button to the second button. And so what happens if I click on the first one, uh, the second button will blink. I would like to add a certain delay between uh, the first button and the second button. I would like to have the second button blinking after 500 milliseconds uh, from the moment I push the first button. And so 500 milliseconds, you know, it's half a second, isn't it? So when I click this, pam, 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 pam. 
Uh, what I will do now is click and duplicate this uh, little d uh, delay object and connect the output of this first delay, uh, so sorry, of the second bang to the input of the first bang. And now what happens? It will happen that I will have two bangs and each one of them will happen uh, every second. One, two, three, four, five. This is a clock, this is a pendulum. It's something that is oscillating, can be an LFO. You can transform this in a MIDI controller that will play kicks and hi-hats. Toots, toots, toots. Or kicks and snails, or two kicks, or whatever. It's the starting point to make a step sequencer or an LFO. It's a clock. But we want to know how many seconds are passing, so I will create another object called counter. And counter needs to show me a number. So I want to count how many times this guy bangs. And so now I know how many seconds are passing since the moment I'm starting working on my software. And it, in the end of the day I will read that number and I will get scared. Ah, I spent all my night there. It's seven in the morning. A simple object, but from here I'm pretty sure you can, you can get an idea of how the software works and what's the philosophy behind it. You have objects, you connect them together, and this will create new operations. The second thing I want to show you is how to create a simple calculator. You know, you might, you might need to make some math when you're making music. You might need to know, uh, for example, what's the delay time you want to put at 125 BPM uh, on, on the delay that has not a quantization parameter. You can work only milliseconds. And that's a simple calculation. You will need to divide two numbers, one for the other. So I need two numbers, yeah? And two numbers are going to be divided. Oof. Divide two numbers. And of course, the result, uh, it has to give me uh, a certain value. So let's plug here. I will plug my first number and my second number. I need a button to trigger this operation. Let's make it smaller. And this button, I will connect it here and here. And now let's select uh, 60,000, which are the milliseconds you have in a minute. And let's divide them for a certain BPM, let's say 120 BPM and then click the button and we know now that uh, the milliseconds we have to set our delay are 500 in order to have one click of the delay every half a second. And of course we might want to divide this by two to have uh, eight notes and divide by two to have 16 notes and on and on and on. And so we can go on adding calculation uh, to, this, to this software. So now we have two devices that can be useful also when making music, not just uh, for, for silly examples like this one. And uh, no this is it.